Okay. <laughs> Okay, perfect. We are live. <laughs> I'm going to start letting folks in. everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm just going to like wait for more folks coming because we still have two minutes, but everyone's on time. Yes, I see this. Everybody's on. I see. Ooh, I see my people. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Prompt. I love it. <laughs> yes, it's so on time. This is great. That's Thank so, you, so good. <laughs> I'd be late. <laughs> I'd be late to my I'd be late to the class I teach. I'd be like, look, y'all, give me five minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just like that, you know. Give give us grace. Give people grace, you know. I mean, time is made up. That's literally my whole project. What, what is time but a lie? <laughs> so why is the lie? It's just a lie. <laughs> you know what? That is that is. Thank you. Thank you so much for seeing. <laughs> myself now. Thank you so much everyone for joining us. We're going to get started in a couple of minutes. We're just going to wait for more people to come in. I'm super excited for this teaching. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Thank you for joining. Yeah, thank you yeah. for hopping on this Zoom call. Wow. Everyone, feel free to share in the comments your name, your pronouns, and where you're from. Um, that would be really great. Uh, we love to do that and just kick off a start of a conversation. But thank you for joining from Amsterdam. This is great. Hey everyone, we're gonna get started because I don't, hi RS, tuning in from Connecticut. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so I'm gonna get started because I wanna honor your time, Nathan, because I have <laughs> you. So my name is Jamie Swift and I'm the executive director of Black More Radicals. It's so nice for everyone to be here. Thank you, thank you so much for tuning in to our this upcoming or this teach-in now uh, for our School for Black Feminist Politics. If you're not familiar with Black More Radicals or the School for Black Feminist Politics, I'm just gonna quickly talk about what those uh, initiatives and organizations are. Black Women Radicals is a Black feminist advocacy organization and we're dedicated to uplifting and centering Black women and gender expansive people's radical activism in Africa and the African diaspora. Our School for Black Feminist Politics was started last year and it's our Black feminist political education hub. And we offer free Black feminist political education courses. And guess what? We invite and pay um, um, amazing scholars, educators, activists, artists to lead, excuse me, teach-ins on the topic of their choice that empowers Black feminisms and Black politics. So I'm so excited <laughs> today to have the one and only Nathan Alexander Moore leading this wonderful teach-in um, that is going to be certainly most definitely insightful. Uh, the title of the teaching is Tectonically Speaking, Writing a Black Geopolitics Through Speculative Fiction. Before I introduce the wonderful Nathan Alexander Moore, I just want to lay down some ground rules that I usually do um, in all the events, right? So this is a safe space, right? Um, we don't allow any homophobia, queerphobia, transphobia, massage and more, white supremacy, ableism, you name it, we don't allow it. And if you cannot abide by those rules, I will gladly kick you out. So please respect this space and respect my guests, right? Our guests. So I would like to introduce the wonderful Nathan Alexander Moore. And Nathan, when I you know, introduce you, the floor uh, is yours. So Nathan Alexander Moore, she, they pronouns, is a black gender fluid trans femme writer, scholar, and dreamer. 
She is interested in critical and creative methods to explore the nuances of blackness, queerness, temporality, usually through the lens of black speculative arts and genre fiction. They hold a master's degree from SUNY Buffalo where they study creative writing in black literature and cultures. Currently, she is a PhD candidate at the University of Texas at Austin in the Department of African and African Diaspora Studies. Their work has previously been published or is forthcoming from Pulse, Pulso, and Remembrance of Orlando from Damaged Goods Press, PQ, O to Queer, and Podunk Review. So Nathan, it's an honor to have you. And look at all these people popping up for you. So um, we're so excited and looking forward to just an excellent teaching. Thank you so much again. All right. Um, hello, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone, for coming uh, virtually. Um, I just want to say again, Thank you, Jamie, um, for creating this space, for curating this space, um, for giving me the opportunity to speak. This is the first time I'm presenting like any portion of my research and I couldn't think of like a better space, a better institution, a better org to work with in Black Women Radicals. So I am so honored, I'm so happy. Um, and yeah, I'm super excited. Um, but before I start, um, again, this is the first time I'm presenting any of my research, but this is also the first time my mama is seeing any of my research. So just say hello to my mother. <laughs> she on the call, say hi, Denise. Hi, Denise. Uh, mama, we did make it. Um, and with that, I'm gonna share my screen and um, begin my teaching. All right. Oh my God, y'all are really saying hi to my mama. I love y'all. <laughs> All right. So, the title of my talk is Tectonically Speaking, Writing a Black Geopolitics Through Speculative Fiction. So, we're supposedly in the middle of a new geological epic called the Anthropocene, and its intended discourses are deeply temporal. Often speaking doubly to both the history of human produced climate crisis on the one hand and a bleak futurity on the other. The imaginaries of the Anthropocene are often wrought with images of catastrophe. However, the question must be asked, what does this naming of catastrophe truly mean for black diasporic subjects who have always already been enduring social and environmental disaster? How does the way that we temporalize and name systems of human interaction with the environment take into account Black diasporic subjects? The moniker of the Anthropocene is both political rallying cry and geosocial temporal schema gives me pause. When we think of Anthropos or man, we must also consider who is summarily and constitutively left out of this framework. Moreover, the totalizing narrative of human factors that drive climate change often do not attend to the history do not attend to nor historicize the long array of the effects of transatlantic slavery, imperialism, and racial capitalism. As a way to get at these various threads, I turn to the work of novelist N.K. Jemisin to investigate how Black diasporic artists are reimagining climate crisis and the way forward through and beyond the limits of Anthropocene discourses. N.K. Jemisin is an award-winning African-American writer who often works through a genre of fantasy and science fiction. Jemisin crafts worlds that are different from our own, but whose imagined realities reflect the deep socio-historical fissures of our own. With the Broken Earth trilogy, Jemisin maps new speculations of the human, temporality, and spatiality. The term Anthropocene conceived, was conceived in the 1980s by ecologist Eugene Stormer, but did not come into broader use and consideration until 2000 when Nobel Prize winning atmospheric chemist Paul Crutzen proposed that the magnitude of human activities on the planet demanded more thoroughgoing attention. However, many scholars have already noted the ways in which the prevailing rhetoric, the prevailing rhetorical stances and discursive logics of the Anthropocene fail to deal with the historical forces that brought us to this current moment. As Davis et al. proposes, quote, the Anthropocene is clearly not a project of human nature or humanity as a whole, but rather interrelated historical processes set in motion by a small minority this privileged cadre provided the preconditions for the development of global capitalism through processes of settler colonialism and enslavement organized and rationalized by racism. Consequently, the centering of an undifferentiated humanity in much Anthropocene scholarship serves to reproduce white supremacist claims to universal knowledge." End quote. 
The failure to recognize the ongoing forces of settler colonialism and, and shadow slavery only served to erase the forces that created the Anthropocene in the first place. This is especially true since many stakeholders have marked the rise of the steam engine in the late 1800s as the beginning of the Anthropocene. Conveniently forgotten are massive genocidal violences against indigenous people, the theft and reshaping of landscape, and the violent expropriation of, ex of enslaved Africans that, are, that only produced these scientific innovations. But these are actually the necessary conditions for those social and environmental progresses. As Heather Todd, as Heather Davis and Zoe Todd note, the universalizing language of the Anthropocene mirrors and reanimates the violence of colonialism, in which all people are the same and therefore governable in the same fashions. More importantly, Davis and Todd address how colonialism began a cycle of severance and displacement that's only logical endpoint is the current climate crisis. I find particularly valuable Davis and Todd's conception of the historical forces of colonization as a shockwave. For Davis and Todd, quote, the seismic shockwave of colonial earth rending is an ongoing epistemic present. And we envision the seismic shockwave as a reckoning, one laying bare the human and environmental injustices of the orders upon which late sage capitalism and white supremacy are built, end quote. Given the marking of the Anthropocene as new, erases the historical violences that made inequitable relationships with the landscape possible. I also want to hold on to the metaphorical and material possibilities of thinking through shock waves and this ongoing present slash presence. By writing with and through the spatialities of the landscape, I move forward to thinking through black temporal imaginations of disaster. I conceive the shock waves of imperial violence moving through the earth, black bodies, and black artistic production. With this in mind, my analysis moves through literature, the ground, past, present, and future. Many scholars have thought together the imbrications of Black life and the Anthropocene. I am indebted to the work of Francois Verg, who has argued that the only way to think of this current time we inhabit is to think of it as the racial capital of scene. Berg asserts that, quote, to unpack the different levels of racialized environment, we need to go back to the long 50th century, the era of Western discoveries, of colonial empires, of genocides, of the slave trade and slavery. The modern world mobilized the work of commodified human beings and uncommodified extra human nature in order to advance, to advance labor productivity within commodity production, end quote. I suggest that this artist's work not only indexes the history of exploitation for people and the landscape, but it is their use of speculative fiction that allows for the ways to be imagined again and again. Therefore, history, specifically think of history as past, and futurity are fluidly realized with the teleology of Western temporal progress not resting on or reifying white colonial conceptions of life, personhood, and humanity. So, additionally, scholars such as Axel Carrera and Catherine Yusoff have begun the work of how to think through the Anthropocene discourses while bringing to bear histories and lived experiences of people from the African diaspora. Carrera specifically has noted that Anthropocene ethics fail to recognize the histories and the presence slash presence of Black death and dying. Carrera has demonstrated how multiple strains of ethical imperatives in response to the Anthropocene have neglected to consider Black life within the bounds of its care. No matter if it is post-human or vitalist, Carrera has argued that these philosophical perspectives fail to recognize the exclusion of Black life as constitutive to forms of living. Carrera conceives of the way forward as necessitating what she calls speculative experimentations as a way to, quote, think the Anthropocene from a non-relational perspective, therefore, is to invite and encourage the oxymoronic to begin from the excluded elsewhere and to dare forbidden juxtapositions. It would mean ultimately allowing the afterlives of slavery and colonialism on the rise to inform how we face the Anthropocene, end quote. Therefore, I turn to the speculative arts and I turn to the speculative arts and the practices of black diasporic artists. The, specifically, the novels by Jemison reveal the paradoxical nature of the Anthropocene in two ways. One, that the current state of the world is the logical conclusion of mechanisms of imperialism, enslavement, and racial capitalism. And two, that the point of crisis is the very opportune time to actualize futures by creating new ways of relating and conceiving of life on this planet. 
By thinking through the connections of the inhuman black body with the inhuman planet, I move towards the speculative spaces conceived in the works of Jemison. Her temporal imaginations of climate crisis actualize the metaphors made by scholars of both blackness and the Anthropocene. With the insights of these scholars in mind, I turn to the work of this artist as a way to think through te the temporality of our current state of climate crisis. However, before I begin my analysis proper, I want to triangulate my project through the works of three scholars in Black studies that have made this work possible. So, Tiffany Latabo King, Catherine McKittrick, and Christina Sharp have written about Black life, geography, and temporality in enabling ways. Without their work, um, this talk would be completely impossible to conceptualize. Their work demonstrates how to both materially and metaphor to work both materially and metaphorically with your subject matter, and it's through that example that I structure my project here. In the Black Shoals offshore formations of Black and Native Studies, King uses the shoal for a metaphorical, material, and theoretical potential. Taking the shoal as a formation that is offshore and neither fully land nor fully sea, the author discusses the site as a space that co-constitutes Blackness and indigeneity. King takes seriously the ways in which the shoal works as both noun and verb to denote both a geological and oceanic site, but also the action of slowing down and disturbing normative flows of things. By following King's lead, I see my work as disruptive of the normative flows of both Anthropocene discourses and Western imperial notions of temporality. Furthermore, I pull from the Black geographic thought of Catherine McKittrick to underpin my analyses of my various art objects. McKittrick has extrapolated Black women's relationship to geography and material, imaginative, and philosophical ways. McKittrick has asserted that geography, both the landscape we inhabit and the scholarly discipline, are socially structured, historically constituted, and has demonstrated how spatiality keeps, marginal, keeps marginalized subjects in place, constructing boundaries of both domination and violence. However, McKittrick also extrapolates the ways in which geography is not solely used by the powerful and necessitates her readers into thinking about how geography is always alterable. By, we, by reading through history and art of the Black diaspora, McKittrick forwards what she calls the poetics of the landscape that, quote, comprises an interdisciplinary and diasporic analytic opening, which advances that creative acts that influence and undermine existing spatial arrangements can also be understood as real responses to real spatial inequities, end quote. With this groundwork, with this groundwork already having been laid by McKittrick, I read Black speculative arts practices as evocative responses to the history of Black geographies of struggle and as attempts to undermine discourses of the Anthropocene that brandish this temporal schema without attending to Black lives. Finally, Christina Sharp's notion of the wake and wake work have been indispensable to my writing and thinking with the art created by Jemison. Sharp has articulated what she perceives as Black life in slash of the wake. Pulling together the multiple definitions of this singular phrase, Sharp has discussed how Black life is structured through the wake of slavery and how Black populations insist life in excess of this structural antagonism. Moreover, as Sharp presents the conditions of the wake as structuring Black life in the present, she also brings attention to the temporal schema that she calls the past that is not past, always returning to rupture the present. The idea of being in, through, and of the wake are issues of Black embodiment and temporality that are deeply generative. It is with the ideal of the shoal, the poetics of the landscape, and the wake that I move forward in conceiving of my writing herein. My project brings together land and sea, past, presence, and presences of Black life, and thinks towards some type of futurity outside and through the present of climate disaster. Moreover, I want to posit the idea of the cataclysm as an analytic to ground and interweave my reading practice for this talk. Cataclysm is defined by Google as both, quote, a large scale and violent event in the natural world and, and a sudden violent upheaval, especially in social or political context. I want to think through these two generative definitions of cataclysm as a way to take seriously the insights provided by Jemison's creative writings. Her work marks both a reckoning with the violence done to racialized bodies and the environment through the connected logics of settler colonialism, white supremacists, and racial capitalist exploitation, and the opportunity we have to change social schemas that made these violations possible in the first place. 
I conceive of her work as cataclysmic because it takes the moment of crisis as the very time to take action and perceives the apocalypse as not necessarily always a bad thing. As I move forward, I want to think together these questions. No, sorry, getting ahead of myself. <laughs> I want to think together these questions. Can we think of cataclysm as a register of both destructive crisis and creative opportunity? And can we think both together without one eclipsing the other? Can we think of cataclysm as the temporal rupture slash eruption that unsettles linear notions of forward progress? How can we write and think cat cataclysm as a Black temporal project, as a Black temporal politics, and as a Black temporal praxis? I argue that we can think of the cataclysm as being attuned to energy, resonances, and reverberations in line with the idea of the shockwave proposed by Heather Todd, by Heather Davis and Zoe Todd, while also thinking of the watery materialities of the wake in Sharp's work. We can think of cataclysm, or perhaps we can think cataclysmically of how the past, its bearings on the now, can shift our thinking towards articulations of futurity. The temporal framing of the Anthropocene as a product of modernity and its presentist bias neglect to fully reckon with the ways in which longer and darker histories inform our, inform our current state of ecological disaster. Furthermore, I want to think through the generative crisis of disaster through the metaphorical and through the metaphorical and analytical register of the cataclysm. The cataclysm, I believe, allows us to think through the racialized histories of environmental disaster while noting this epic of the Anthropocene as having the potential to mark out an otherwise or a new way of being. I suggest that this artist and her work mark a way forward that is not an escape from the past, but a recognition of the serviceability of that past in paradoxical but beautiful ways. So this is a quote that begins the first novel. Let's start with the end of the world, why don't we? Get it over with and move on to some more interesting things, end quote. This is where we begin the novel. This is where we begin the series. With the apocalypse, with rupture, with destruction. But the narrator tells us straight off that this is not the least important thing. If not, it is the least interesting. From the very beginning, Jemison makes it clear to her readers that her book is about time, catastrophe, and earth. The end is often, the end of the world is often called the end times, and it is always conceived of as a future oriented project, something that will happen far off in the distance of time. The end of the world is an event that will happen. However, as Jemison elaborates so beautifully in her series, some people, especially those people who are not seen as people, the end of the world is as common and recurrence as an everyday event. In this way, the catastrophe was always going to happen was bound to happen. There was never any way of escaping this kind of tragedy. However, Jemison also notes that this history is largely unwritten or at the very least unacknowledged. Jemison narrator tells us that, quote, memories are as fragile as stale, as stale, as slate in the stillness, demonstrating that the very writing of history and one's relationship to the past is brittle, is contextual and is more than anything else entirely vulnerable, not only to destruction, but as we learn as the series progresses, also violent erasure and revision. Jemison's initial chapter ends as provocatively as it began, bringing into relief ever more sharply the ways in which time as history and the earth and subjectivity are interconnected. The narrator asserts that, quote, this is what you must remember. The ending of one story is just the beginning of another. This has happened before, after all. People die, old orders pass, new societies are born. When we say the world has ended, it's usually a lie because the planet is just fine. But this is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends for the last time." End quote. With this first novel, Jemison begins to demonstrate her prowess in mining the material and metaphorical weight of strata. In both content and form, Jemison gives us a narrative that is stratified, and purposely so. Each subsequent chapter following the end is ended with a piece of historical historiographical writing from within the fictional world of the stillness. Sometimes it is academic literature, sometimes it's folklore, 
And other times, it's even uh, a form of official government uh, correspondence between uh, sociopolitical leaders. No matter what form it takes, Jemison's laying of narrative types mirrors the laying of the mirrors the layering of history and historical perspectives. This artistic rendering serves to emblematize the struggle of historiography that is also a struggle of strata, also a struggle over the very landscape and those who occupy it. The master narrative of the ruling class of the city humanists, which at the beginning of the novel is completely obliterated, um, seems on the surface to be stable. But as Jemison reveals again and again over the course of her trilogy, there are many stories beneath the story of the ruling class, and there is even particular granules of difference within each layer of history. So overall, temporality works strangely in the stillness. As the title of the book signifies, inhabitants of the stillness recognize five seasons, with the fifth, and it's always called a season or the season, being a time of crisis. It is when some event of geothermal catastrophe has occurred and the rules and structures of society must shift, when survival becomes the highest law. In this way, apocalypse is not only ordinary, but expected. In this world, the end of the world has happened so many times over. And in this way, tempor temporality on the, content of the stillness, on the continent of the stillness moves against linear notions of progress. As the cyclical nature of disaster destabilizes our familiar theological schema with the end of the world being in the future tense. For people living and surviving on the unstable ground of the stillness, the end of the world can simultaneously be past, right now, and the future as well. More specifically, we see language and history shift in real time. We meet our protagonist as soon and see her life shatter as she is found out to be an origin, and that's a term we'll come back to uh, quickly. Um, so she's an origin, and she must take to the road and find her daughter and bring justice to her and bring justice to her husband who has murdered their son. Not only as not only has Asun's world ended, she is flung into a future that is unstable both personally and globally. We see her inner thoughts edit themselves as verb tenses shift. She must now think of both Yumenes, the capital city, and Uche, her murdered son, in the past tense. Finally, the annotation slash insertions of the text at the end of each chapter reveals the interdependence of past, present, and future. The stone lore, which is what is the fictional world's um, historical documents serve as the bedrock of each chapter. In a material and metaphorical sense, the language rests on this history. As the series progresses, Jemison pulls from the material structures in our world and the geographies of social inequities along racial lines to cement her world into a plausible, if not terrifying, shape. So let's return to the idea and the, posi and the positionality and the subjectivity of the origin. In the fictional world that she has created, there are two conceptions of the human, the still and the origin with the latter not even being seen as human at all. An origin, an origin in this world is a person who has the capacity to form orogeny. And in our world, orogeny literally just means the kind of physical process of like a mountain forming. But in this world, orogeny is that, but also the magical manipulation of earth, kinetic energy, and heat. Sorry, I'm gonna skip past this. <laughs> I, was a, <laughs> I was a little slow. So. Where was I? So origins are powerful. Origins are powerful. Like they have magic, they just kick a bunch of ass, they're super powerful, um, but they are feared for this power. There is even a slur that is used to demean them and that term is Raga. Um, and I can't help but hear and notice how smoothly both phonetically and semantically this term twins with the word nigga, right? So I make the argument that Raga and nigga are the, basically the same and we should pay attention to that. Um, the world that Jemison has built from the ground up actualizes actually some of the recent work done um, about blackness and about Blackness and the Anthropocene. Um, to quote Catherine Yusoff, Blackness is, quote, a historically constituted and intentionally enacted deformation in the formation of subjectivity, a deformation that presses an inhuman categorization and the inhuman earth into intimacy, 
This contact point of geographical proximity with the earth was constructed specifically as a node of extraction of properties and personhood. In other words, the historical ways in which white supremacy has valued both the landscape and black bodies as property to be owned and exploited. Jemison rewrites this history, this history masterfully in the figure of the origin, who, as, who are seen as an embodiment of the will of, quote, the evil earth. Origins are blamed for the instability of social systems, just as the instability of the earth is attributed to this hated notion of the planet itself. Demonstrating the ways in which the serviceability of the land has paralleled and intersected with the fungibility of blackness, Jemison simply collapses this arbitrary and fragile distinction with the figure of the origin. In this way, N.K. Jemison reveals that social and ecological disaster are part and parcel of the same social engineering, what we could think of as a certain kind of socio-political world building, if you will. The eerie reminiscence of Blackness continues and becomes more explicit as Jemison reveals more layers of the life of her main character and the history of the world that she has created. We learned that by the end of the novel, the, book, the sections that are about Damia and Cyanite and Asun are actually different points in the same life of the same character. Therefore, a personal history of one origin is revealed and recurs throughout, throughout the text. The narrative and time periods are stratified one atop the other like the layers of the earth. More importantly, as readers learn more about the particularity or what we could perhaps call the granularity of Asun's past lives, it is clear that origins metaphorically and materially share social strata with Black people of our world. When Cyanite, who, who was Damia, the little girl, and who will become Asun, the grown woman we meet at the beginning of the novel, so when Cyanite is sent on a mission with her mentor slash breeding partner, Alabaster Ten Rings, she comes to question her place in the world. Although Cyanite understands firsthand the hatred of origins and the lifestyle of the fulcrum, which in their world is a training facility where origins go to basically learn how to control their powers and basically be useful to society. And if they're not useful to society, they get murdered. So she goes on a mission and she comes face to face with the violent ways in which the world treats people like her. Um, specifically, she goes to this place that's called a node station. So they live on a continent which is just racked with seismic activity and they have people who can control that activity. So people are placed on specific nodes that basically like quell the landscape, right? Um, she knows that in theory, but seeing it in practice is something else. So when Cyanite is brought to the node station, she is met with this spectacle, quote, the body in the node maintainer's chair is small and naked, thin. It's limbed atrophied, it's hairless. There are things, tubes and pipes and things she has no words for coming out of its thick arms, down the goggle throat, across the narrow crotch. There is a flexible bag on the corpse's belly. It's attached to its belly somehow and it's full of, ugh, the bag needs to be changed, end quote. When Cyanite is stunned into disbelief by the prone and nearly lifeless body, it is Alabaster, her partner, who explains the spectacle of domination to them both. He explains that a procedure has been done to sever the self-control and will from the origin so that all they know how to do is quell seismic activity. The whole being of this figure before them is in order to serve the human state. Alabaster makes a, a point to use Raga repeatedly to demonstrate that this is what he and Cyanite are to the governing nation as nothing more than a tool. And even though she understands that it is, the, that it is ingenious to do this, it is terrible to limit someone's perspective and life to just being the ability to serve others. With this scene, Jemison reanimates the histories that conclude with the subjugation of Black bodies being coterminous with and necessitated by the domination of the landscape. Yusuf asserts that, quote, the division of matter into non-life and life pertains not only to matter, but to the racial organization of life foundational to new, West, to new world geographies. Slavery was a geologic axiom and the inhuman, of the inhuman in which non-being was made, reproduced, and circulated as flesh, end quote. Blackness as inhuman matter, as non-being in the world, extended from and was imbricated with the reshaping of the landscape. This social practice was part of the landscape, both materially and ideologically. Slaves reshaped, cultivated, and stabilized the landscape, both with their plantation labor, their reproductive capacity, and being the exemplar for an outside of freedom. 
an outside of freedom and an outside of humanity as well. Therefore, the spectacle of the known maintainer of a raga or a nigga um, being reduced to flesh must maintain that must maintain the metaphorical and material landscape of the empire remarks a history that is already known to many but left unacknowledged in Anthropocene discourses. <sighs> Sorry, that was it's a very heavy. <laughs> um, Jemison demonstrates the strata, the very ground upon which environmentalists and scientists and policymakers speak from with any level of stability is held together by the history and present and assumed future of black negation and exploitation. In other words, we can think of spaces, in other words, we can think of the geographical, the, we can think in the geographical register of scholars such as Catherine McKittrick in that quote, those who occupy the spaces of otherness are always already encountering space and therefore articulating how genres of humanness are intimately connected with where we slash they are ontologically and geographically, end quote. Both ideologically and materially, the place blackness occupies in the social order is grounded. It's grounded. It is in slash of the earth. And perhaps the only way we know notions of stability come from this point of deformation. Jemison's writing shows us that social and geographical stability can only be held together by the degradation of the origins of ragas, of niggas. In this way, Jemison uses the structural forces of anti-Blackness to underpin her characterization of the origins, the world building of the stillness, and to disrupt the normative flows of discourse around the supposedly new epic of climate catastrophe. By thinking and writing with the landscape and with Blackness therein, Jemison demonstrates that ecological disaster is part and parcel of the disaster that is anti-Blackness, that is enslavement, and its geographical slash geological afterlife. Jemison makes a strident critique through the use of her geohistorical knowledge. Even when cyanide and alabaster flee to the contingent um, safety of an island city named Miav, which I would argue is kind of a not too subtle um, imagery of Marinage, um, Alabaster tells her that they are never safe, not in a world as it is, not in this world as it is currently constructed. Cyanide understands this and thinks, quote, she is a slave, all ragas are slaves, that the security and sense of self-worth of the fulcrum that is offered is wrapped up in chains of her right to live and even the right to control of her own body, end quote. There is no clear way that Jemison could have made her point that origins as ragas, as niggas, are the necessary bedrock for the formation of the stillness, the coalescence of the human estate, and the riches therein. These figures are not just a tool to shape the socio-political landscape, they are the socio-political landscape, and social conventions cohere into stability because of this position. However, as the series progresses, and as the soon endures even more hardships and heartache, there's also the promise of something beyond the geographical inequities that Jemison has so masterfully articulated. As the narrator remarks at the end of the first book, quote, but what is important is that you must know it was not all terrible. There was peace and long stretches between each catastrophe, a chance to cool and solidify before being ground, before the grind resumed, end quote. Therefore, even though Jemison attends to the strata of history, she does not allow her work to fall into, into a nihilistic teleology in which violence always happens, in which the system must always terminate in domination. Jemison demonstrates that history and the narratives we take from it, like the very earth that, is, that we think is assumably stable, has fluid and hot potentiality that undergirds this whole system. Just as the tectonic plates of this planet float on liquid magma, so do the facts of any geohistorical narrative rest upon a churning undercurrent of potentiality. As the trilogy progresses, possibility becomes one of the major axioms upon which the narrative turns, usually with molten intensity. As Emerson reveals more and more of the geohistorical narrative that underpins her series, she also reveals the capacity of her characters to change and to grow, but not always for the best. When Asun learns that, when Asun learns to trust people and finds home among an underground community called Kastrima, her daughter Nasun, on the other hand, learns all too early the cruelty that the world has deemed her portion. We can think of both of these characters moving forward into a future. However, Asun sees the glittering possibilities of change in the cracks of the system as it is, 
while Nassoon falls into a yawning abyss of nihilism and futility as she draws both on her own history and how the world has treated origins as useful tools and dangerous weapons historically. Through her writing, Jemison acknowledges the contingent nature of possibility, that it rather that it registers both the possibility of a more livable future if we can all a more livable future in which we can all hopefully thrive, but also that if business as usual continues, there's no way in which any of us will survive. Moreover, Jemison presents her readers with the insight that in times of crisis, past, present, and future converge in powerfully generative but also destructive ways. The past, in the form of foundational inequities, can seemingly erupt from the very earth that we stand on. And the particulates that are brought forth from this rending and upheaval have the potential to obscure any clear sight of the future unless it is reckoned with and navigated accordingly. It is from this perspective that I engage the rest of Jemison's trilogy. With her second novel, The Obelisk Gate, Jemison moves her narrative forward while also hinting at the supple and perhaps arbitrary limitations that we put on time that we put on time, our narration of it, and the narratives about our own subjectivity that we understand through it. The, narrative, the narrator of the novel begins by noting that he's telling the story wrong and that quote, after all, a person is herself and others. Relationships chisel the final shape of one's being. I am me and you. Damaya was herself and the family that rejected her and the people of the fulcrum who chiseled her into a fine point. Sayana was Alabaster and Anan and the people of poor Alia and Miav. Now you are Tarimo and the Ashroom Roads Walkers and your dead children and also the living one whom you will get back." End quote. Once again, Jemison interweaves the metaphor of earthly materiality with conceptions of time and with memory and about any speculations we might have about the future. The chiseling that Asun has undergone through the tumultuous time of her life has also been layered. It is stratified with the experience of everyone she has loved, everyone who has harmed her, and everyone that she has harmed. In this way, her life has been sedimented with the experiences of her past, and with great heat and tremendous pressure, she is seemingly crystallized into the form we now know her as. However, with the last two sentences, the narrator asks Asun and readers to think differently and to reimagine by using the very ground of her life and experience as the foundation for such a feat. Jemison's novelistic work urges readers to think of the paradoxical but productive nature of reckoning with the past while pertaining to an imminent future. If we can again and again think of the elastic nature, experience, and imagination of time, we might also imagine a future that can be enacted in our present. The second novel in the Broken Earth trilogy focuses more time on Nassun and her travels after leaving Tarima with her father, Jicha. They live on the road, traveling south for some time and to a destination of which Nassun is unsure. What she is sure of, however, is that her father hates people like herself and hates her on some level. And she must navigate his bitter and poisonous love for her and endure she does. Nisun is abused physically, but even more so emotionally. And we as reader learn that she, the daughter, has already suffered some mistreatment from the hands of her mother, Asun. Asun taught her daughter how to control herself in the brutal pedagogical dispositions of the fulcrum where she was trained. Asun therefore yells at her daughter, throws boulders at her, and solidifies shame in the very heart of Nisun. What Nisun and her body remembers most though is the broken hand that her mother smashed with a rock. Her mother presumes that if Nisun can control herself under the most extreme conditions of pain, if she can force herself not to use Arajni even under the duress of a broken limb, then Asun knows her daughter will be safe. This is the same protocol of the fulcrum. This is the same level of care that was administered to Asun herself. It's the same socio-political treatment the world has offered up for all origins. In this way, Asun has no future outside of disaster. She has nothing to look forward to other than her own apocalypse. Therefore, Nasun, as origin, as Raga, as nigga, begs a pertinent question for our now. Is this Anthropocene really a new epoch for Black people who have lived, relived, and continually survived disaster? Moreover, moreover how might this current discursive moment bring about any feasible social and political change for Black people? The long history of Black mattering and its relationship to the inhuman structure of our present structures the discourse of the Anthropocene and the, 
and structures the very imaginations we propose of any future beyond this point. This is our structural reality, but does that mean, but what does that mean for the intramural relationships that happen between subjects that this system presses upon, that it materially oppresses? One supposed answer comes from Nassoon at the end of the second novel when she concludes that the only logical path forward is destruction. And this eschatological determination is found amongst and in the aftermath of her, of her father's final attempt at her life. When her father calls her sweetening while brandishing a knife at her, she realizes there was never another path, never another future, but one ending in death and damnation. When she tries to speak to Jija, her father keeps looking at her, looking at her eyes in particular, she always had her mother's eyes, end quote. As we see again, the past and the future grind together, erasing the present to an almost imperceptible sliver and necessitating urgent action. Nasoon concludes that, quote, suddenly it doesn't matter. Nasoon sighs and rubs her face with her hands, as weary as Father Earth must be after so many eternities of hate. Hate is tiring. Nihilism is easier, though she does not know what this word means and won't know for a few years, is what she feels, regardless, an overwhelming sense of the meaninglessness of it all, end quote. With this brief glimpse into Nasoon's interiority, we as readers also get to see her sense of temporality. Although she is barely 10 years old, she feels as old as the earth, sedimented with so much pain that she has endured seemingly eternities of time. And she knows why this is. She becomes more and more aware of this geohistory in the world that in the world as she has engaged with her father over the past year. She ends this conversation with her father by saying that loving him simply became too hard at times. These are the last words she says to her father before he tries to kill her. And she taps into the immeasurable force of her magic and turns him into stone. When her father's body solidifies and then subsequently shatters, he becomes a monument of the geo history that, more, that Jemison has so masterfully constructed. The origin or the Raga or the Nega is nothing but an inhuman disaster walking, tied to the land and confined by it. There is no future beyond destruction. There is no present. There is only the hardened and heavy past and the empty volatile future. This fact and so much more is why Nasoon decides that she herself must end the world. The third and final novel in Jemison's magnum opus begins yet again with the end of the world. However, the stone sky and its narrator find that the apocalypse is not only unremarkable, it is somehow necessary in some regards. With this third installment in the trilogy, we find out more explicitly that Hoa, who has been Asun's little <laughs> her little confidant throughout her adventures is actually the narrator of the whole series. He's not even human. He's this supernatural creature that we don't have really time, too much time to get into, but he's been watching everything and he's been the one actually telling the story to the reader. Um, more importantly, Hoa presents the reader with a long history of the stillness, explicating the history of the world before the stillness and the great nation that existed before it called Sil Anagis. With this final novel, everything is uncovered and all the themes and plot lines explored in the previous book come to a head. We learn why and how Hoa is the way he is, how the mythical race of the stone eaters were created, and we are presented with the notion that the end of the world is actually the prime time to build more livable futures. Echoing the opening of the first book, but in reverse, Hoa suggests that, quote, time grows short, my love. Let's end with the beginning of the world, shall we? Yes, we shall, end quote. With this provocative and ironic beginning, Jemison charts her final refusal of linear time and the temporal pro and notes the temporal paradox of progress. With this small but packed sentence, Jemison invites her readers to take seriously the point that time is relative, that history is arbitrary, and that the choices we make matter and might have the very weight of the world resting upon them. Hoa's recounting of the fall of Sil Anagist mirrors our current moment of, quote, climate crisis and heightened awareness of the depths of anti-Blackness that undergird the American liberal nation state. The ideals of modernity, such as progress and technological advancement, have been shown to be quite harmful now that we are in the Anthropocene. The extractive use of land and resources, pollution, and other environmental atrocities have been exposed have exposed that our sense of progress is underwritten by the destruction of the very earth that we must survive upon. 
More often than not, discourses of the Anthropocene have turned into discourses of the apocalypse, of nihilism, of the fruitlessness of any endeavor to try and change the world. However, discourses of the Anthropocene have largely only discussed the disaster of the earth, of ecosystems, and the climate without factoring in the human disasters that are coterminous with and undergird the very destruction of the former. Jemison, with her construction of the fictional world of the stillness, the counter history of still anagist, and her deep meditation on the interconnections of race and the landscape, demonstrates that these two scales of loss can never be separated. With the retelling of the rise and fall of still anagist, Jemison brings to bear the totality of the history of racism upon climate crisis. Still anagist exploitation of certain racialized populations is not parallel to their unrestrained desecration of the earth. It is central to it. With this history, Jemison distorts notions of clear distinction between past and present. While also taking to task notions of linear temporal progress in which technological advancement means modernity, means positive societal growth. With these novels, Jemison shows that the current moment is not separated from the brutal past that we must somehow move beyond. She presents the utter impossibility of this, of this idea. The past is nothing more than a reverberation felt more acutely and differently in our present moment. Moreover, Jemison's relate revelation of a hyper-advanced, techno-savvy past clashes productively with the world of the stillness that she has previously crafted. The reality that her characters must survive through seems what we could think of as primitive or pre-modern by current social understandings, because like their greatest, um, their greatest invention is like indoor plumbing and like heated water. However, the progressive the progressive temporal tele teleology that prizes subjects and societies moving from supposed primitive brutality and barbarism towards modern decency and refinement is undercut in this novelistic work. Jemison proves that this conception of progress is arbitrary while also unearthing a layer of, of the substrata of modernity that functions on racism and resource extraction. Through multiple characters, Jemison presents how multiple futures may form in response to the inevitable crisis facilitated by systems of inequity. Jemison makes her readers question what it might mean to relate to the earth differently, to understand the earth as a thing that is vibrantly alive and deeply wounded. In this way, Jemison portrays the absolute harm that has been done to both the earth and to people who have been used as objects themselves. Moreover, Jemison is writing a story of our present, however fantastically it may be rendered. The Anthropocene, as, geopol as geopolitical e epoch, is demanding that we evaluate our current relationship to the lands we live on and begrudgingly share. The Anthropocene necessitates a reevaluation of the planet and an assertion that the planet, in its own particular way, enacts agency upon human lives, even those lives that are not seen as human, perhaps especially those lives. What might it mean for us to conceive of the planet as reacting to the exploitation and harm that it has been dealt? What might it mean to reframe any future through and beyond the Anthropocene as the earth responding to this treatment? How could we move forward with the idea of interdependence not only happening between sociopolitical actors on the earth, but also as interlocutors with the earth? However fantastical a form of Jemison's critique may come in, the content of her prose is so very, very relevant to our current moment. Simultaneously, Jemison's speculative fiction takes the task both the long history of exploitation of Black people and the planet, while also critiquing discourses of environmental action that would seek to decouple the inhuman as matter from the inhuman as race. In the figure of Assume, we see a reassertion of these dual forms of being and mattering, getting just a glimpse of a more just and more livable future. The third novel culminates in a soon facing off against the daughter she hasn't seen for almost two years. She learns that her daughter has not only grown physically, but also has matured in her use of magic. Asun learns that her daughter, oh wait, I already said that, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so Asun has grown in her use of magic so much so that she rivals the woman who birthed her. However, Nasun is the only one who can control the onyx, which is 
this super powerful crystal. So they were like crystals in all the in the images I've shown, and we'll get to that in a minute. There are these things called obelisks, which are these objects that Origins can use for magic. And the most powerful is the onyx, which is the black one, which I think is important. Um, so the imagery of an immeasurably powerful and immensely generative force of blackness is where I want to end. The first scene we get of the onyx is when Hoa is retelling his choice to destroy Silanagis in the far past. Hoa asserts that, quote, the onyx is powerful, frightening, the darkest of the dark, unknowable, end quote. In this way, the, the onyx embodies all the qualities of blackness that exists in the white supremacist imagination. It is threatening, uncontrollable, and fecund beyond measure. It is that both and that I find enabling for reading this scene and the insights that can be mined from Jemison's work. As a rejoinder and an alternative path forward, Jemison makes us consider what an Anthropocene ethics might look like to center the blackness of ground, the racial mattering of strata. When Hoa first reaches, the, reaches for the onyx, he notes that, quote, put enough lives into a storage matrix and they retain a collective will of sorts. They remember horror and atrocity and what is, and is, and what, it, oh Lord, with whatever is left in them, you might say it's their souls. So the onyx yields to me because it senses at last that I too have pain. My eyes have been open to my own exploitation and degradation. I am afraid, of course, and angry and hurt, but the onyx does not scorn these feelings within me. It seeks something else, however, something more, and finally finds what it seeks nestled in a little burning knot behind my heart, determination. I have committed myself to making of all this wrongness something right. That's what the onyx wants, justice, end quote. In this scene, we as readers encounter yet again how history grinds against the future. The onyx embodies the powerful forces of past grievances and their weight on present actors. It is this collective black will that Hoa that is with this collective black will that Hoa chooses the destruction of still anages to be the correct choice of act of action. In this way, Jemison valorates efforts by racialized subjects that look like violent uprising, that look like riots, that look like looting, that look like violent insurrection. These are the magmatic expressions of a concealed but churning rage that's finally broken the surface. And in the end, this is justified as some things must be destroyed for a better future to be reconstructed from a different foundation. This is this is why when centuries later, when Asun reaches for the power of the onyx, she is only forestalled from, her from the apocalyptic yearnings of her daughter. She quote says, when the onyx finds me, however, something is different this time, a fear of kin, a fear of, a fear of failure, the fear that accompanies all necessary change and under it all, a driving need to make the world better, end quote. In her final moments, Asun is afraid for she does not know what the future, what, okay. <laughs> as soon as afraid, for she does not know if the future that she wants is a certainty. Even though all the pieces are in place and the conditions seem correct, there is always the possibility of failure, always the potential for destruction. And, the, and in the end, Asun gives up knowing, gives up knowing that fighting for her daughter will destroy both of them. She uses her own willpower and that of the onyx to snatch away the deadly magic that would turn her daughter to stone. And in that moment realizes that there is no certainty of the future, that she must only do what she can. And what she can do is save her daughter. Asun dies, the price of magic being paid, turning her fully to stone. Nasun survives with just one hand transformed and the onyx still waiting to execute her order. Nasun quote, cannot stop staring at Asun's drying tears because the world had took and took and took from her too, after all. She knows this, and yet for some reason, she does not think she'll ever understand. Even as Asun died, she was reaching for the moon and reaching for her daughter." End quote. After witnessing this final act, not of war, but of vulnerability and surrender, does Nasun choose to full star the apocalypse for one last time. She chooses to bring things into the alignment, into alignment and hopefully for a better future, even if she is unsure if it will ever happen. This final act is as brutal as it is touching, and one may come away with the conclusion that it is pointless to hope for a future for Black people, especially in the geological epoch of the Anthropocene. 
The disaster that is being charted is one that may consume us all. However, as Jemison has demonstrated, there is a way forward. There is a future of possibility that can be channeled through a reckoning with the racialized politics of land. Discourses of the Anthropocene have failed to acknowledge the histories of racialized oppression that subtend the presentist bias of this geopolitical epic. Alternatively, Jemison demonstrates that time and time again, there is a way forward. With the imagery of the onyx and Assun's final act of sacrifice for her daughter, Jemison writes an ethic that proclaims when a caring for and with blackness is central, the building of a future is possible, is that much more possible. This ending points to the fact that what has happened to us is inescapable. It is written into our black bodies. It is written into the very land that these bodies stand upon. This is both equal parts horrifying and enabling for we need this history and this relationship to the earth. Paradoxically, it is the holding on to this past that allows us a way forward. This sense of futurity is garnered from the sediment of the past, letting us know that the future is always being built in the now by us on top of the past that is still ever present, but alterable. All we have is our knowledge of the past grinding upon us, insisting that it is essential to our future. Jemison expresses that a new ethics of care for both Black life and the planet are not only possible, they are necessary. The ending of the world means the promise of another, perhaps a yearning for a better one. I have, attempt with, I have attempted with this writing to read together the speculative work of Jemison alongside the rather unimaginative utterances that dominate discourses of the Anthropocene. I have tried to evoke the productive capacity of Black artists and their speculative works to speak other truths beyond the stable temporal schema of the Anthropocene. As Jemison herself observed in her, in her acceptance speech of the 2018 Hugo Award for Best Novel, quote, we are the cre we creators are the engineers of possibility. And as this genre finally, however grudgingly, acknowledges that the dreams of marginalized of the marginalized matter and that all of us have a future, so will go the world soon, I hope. End quote. I too hope that we can imagine ourselves through and beyond the disaster of white supremacy, racial capitalism, and imperialism. If the past is bearing upon the future, we might think seriously and imagine fantastically a new landscape and relationship to that landscape. One that is deep, that does not turn away from horrors, that does not fear, that does not fear failure or shun loss, that does not fear destruction, but sees destruction as the first act in building beyond our current constraints. In this way, climate crisis is the future of humanity and perhaps humanity as a category should be in crisis. For there are other ways to be, there were always other ways to be, there will always be other ways to be. Um, thank you. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan. I mean, you should see these comments. Um, I'm going to give you a little break before we get into the Q&A because I know you were talking a <laughs> <laughs> Your girl is harsh. I just want to say that teaching was so brilliant. You should see the comments. Amazing, beautiful. These parallels are so powerful. And what you shared fills me with optimism. Thank you. Brilliant love. And I'm so proud of you. Incredible. This was, was brilliant. And also, I want to say something before we get into the Q&A. I wanted to surprise you. And so I invited N.K. Jemison to the conversation, right? I know you fucking lying. No, I really did. And she actually, through her publicist, got back to me. Unfortunately, she couldn't make it, but I wanted to tell you what she said to you. She said, Dear Jamie, Nora so appreciates you reaching out about this. Unfortunately, an existing obligation today is running longer than expected, and she won't be able to participate this time. She sends along her very best wishes to Nathan and hopes you and yours are having a healthy and safe 2021. So she knows about your teaching. She knows it was today. And listen, maybe in the future, um, there could be a connection there because she was trying to make it, but a previous obligation occurred. So just know that N.K. Jemison knows about your work. 
Well, you you try to make me cry on the chat. You try to make me cry on all these nice people. That's what you're trying to do, Jamie. <laughs> That's um that's wonderful. I actually got to meet her when I was in my master's program when like the first book in the series came out. And she was super dope, super nice. And I like had completely forgotten that she signed my book until I was like working on this chapter of my dissertation, which turned into this talk and I opened it. I was just like, I was like, oh yeah, that happened. So that's that's dope. Um yeah. I thought she was gonna like pop on the call and I was just gonna die. Y'all was just gonna see me die in real time. <laughs> Not to make you die, but to be excited, you know, like I wanted her to pop up. That was the whole goal to pop up and she wanted to be here, but I'm gonna share her your your uh I'm gonna share your teaching with her. And yeah, I I she knows about it. So um I hope that <laughs> I hope yeah. that some joy but let's get into this q a what i'm gonna do yes. is take off my face because this is about you i just wanted to like uh come in um mm-hmm. but i'm going to like you're gonna can you hear my voice can everyone hear my voice okay perfect so one of the first questions was hello i don't know if i'm saying is a yuki hello i'm not sure the oh no this is wrong question my bad somebody else <laughs> Uh, someone asks, thank you so much, Nathan, for sharing your research today. I'm so interested in this important and interesting topic and would love to read more. Is there perhaps a place where I can read your research on this or a list of texts to begin with? Um, we shared, I think, I mean, first off, because this work is animated just by the lovely mind and spirit and intellect of N.K. Jemison, you should just <laughs> you should just read the whole Broken Earth trilogy. Um, Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong. We we like shared like some of the sources I use for this talk um, already, or we will in the future. Um, but definitely read this series. I think you should definitely read the Black Shoals um, by Tiffany Lithop. Latabo King. Um, you should read Demonic Ground by Catherine McKittrick. I think you should read um, In the Wake by Christina Sharp. There's an article by Axel Carrera that's really dope about um, the Anthropocene and its ideas of eth- ethics and how those ethics actually fail Black folk. Um, there's this book by Catherine Yusoff called um, A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None, which she really kind of like takes to task the ways in which discourses of environmentalism really only talk about the land, but never talk about like pretty much what I was talking about in my talk, the history that gets us here, which is the history of white supremacy, the history of racial capitalism, the history of enslavement, the history of colonialism, right? So um, those are really dope sources. And those are things I definitely think you should write about uh, or you should read, and yeah, you should write about. Um, sadly, uh, none of my research for this is published as of yet. Um, this was um, adapted from a dissertation chapter, which I will probably edit after this talk, since I since you saw me stumbling through it a little. Um, but um, yeah, none of my research is published as of yet. I have an article that will be coming out in August that's about um, What's well, about trans femininity and visibility politics, um, but that's not really connected to any of the work for my dissertation. Um, but yeah, hopefully soon. You know, uh, your girl is supposed to graduate in a year from now and defend her dissertation, and then hopefully, you know, not too soon after that, this beautiful dissertation that is taking up so much time at work and working, so many of my nerves <laughs> so wonderfully will be a book. But um, yeah. Sadly, no, none of my none of my research is um, published as of yet. But as you see on the slide, if y'all have any more questions or just want to reach out and shoot the shit, like I say all the time, I'm just a black nerd that loves to talk about black nerdy shit. So feel free to like jump in my inbox, um, at me on Twitter, slide my DMs. Like I'm very very available. Um, so yeah, I think that was a, I think that was the end of a very long answer to a pretty short question. <laughs> It was perfect, Nathan. Um, So yeah, someone asked really quickly, what was the last text you mentioned? And I'm not sure if you remember the text, but they uh, just wanted to know. So yeah, the last text I think I mentioned was A Billion Black Anthropocenes by Catherine Yusoff, who is a critical geographer who's really thinking about the social geography of the Anthropocene, like the rhetoric and the discourse around the Anthropocene, and then, you know, bringing that, bringing all that together and 
basically like fucking it up with black feminist theory and black feminist discourse to think about like actually um we can't really talk about the anthropocene and not talk about blackness anti-blackness white supremacy racial capitalism we can't actually have a full necessary conversation without thinking about like kind of those overarching or perhaps underpinning like foundational kind of inequities and harms and violations right definitely thank you for sharing that and also by the way you have a lot of questions and i know that we won't get through all of them so please please don't feel offended if we don't get to your question um Nathan um, has offered her uh, email. I think I see my chat box is blocking it. Yes, I can see it. So please, you know, email her, feel free to write her, but please don't get mad at me if I don't read your question. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so the next question is, I'm by, from Ara. I'm African Somali diaspora, she, her, writing my thesis on speculative realism and poetry. It's so hard to maneuver in this university as it's white and alien alienating. How do I write without them accusing me of disqualifying their theories, even though they are wrong? Um, so yeah, that's real. Cause I definitely feel that cause my whole project is about temporality and black speculation and speculative fiction and you know there's a lot of con like canonical and like western continental philosophy about um temporality but none of that serves me right like why would i talk about hegel when he says black people don't have any damn history like why would i why would i speak to these interlocutors if they're not speaking to me and like i get that that can be work right we can engage with um these canonical like white figures of like thought, right? These canonical like white patriarchs of thought, right? But like, I'd rather just be talking to other black people who are actually saying things to me and I'm saying things to them, right? So I think more than thinking about like, how am I gonna navigate these white men is to push them off the damn table and, you know, look at what black theorists are saying about this. And, you know, unless like your advisor tells you, oh, you have to read this, right? Um, don't, like, I don't think, I don't think that's work that feels good to me. Um, that's not work that feels generative to me. Um, you know, I think the university system is already so white and patriarchal and violent as hell anyway, that like the space that should be nourishing, that should be generative, that should feel like a homecoming, which is your work, should be that and you should just think about how you're situating yourself within the fields right so it sounds like you're probably you like might be like an english major or maybe if you're in black studies like there's ways in which you don't have to like have these white men on your shoulder breathing down your neck we are trying to write like beautiful dope ass theory at least what it sounds like is beautiful dope ass theory you should just be like speaking with other black scholars and other black thought because people have done it like, I really don't understand um, the need to speak to other like white historical men when like black feminists have said it better, more clearly, doper, um, to be honest. So that would be, that would be mine. That would be my, uh, um, that would be my little piece of advice on top of just making sure you take care of yourself. Like, just don't, <laughs> just don't answer emails when it feels like it's some bullshit to be like, oh, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go read. Like, I just go read comics <laughs> and just turn off my inbox and stuff. So yeah, I think it's really about like situating your work in what kind of field and what kind of thought and what kind of people you actually wanna talk to rather than thinking about who you need to talk to or who you don't wanna talk to. Um, and that insight has been really great for me as um, someone who's in black studies. It's just like actually where the conversation, where the center then white folk is over there being messy, but they've always been over there and being messy. We're going to be right here um, doing what we need to do. <laughs> yes, so powerful. Um, there is another question by, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, and please forgive me if I'm not, Lise Oliver LaRue. And their question is, in larger context of your dissertation and research, how do you see the theorizing within Black Shoals demonic grounds and in the wake informing your theorizing of transness and gender fluidity. I'm working through these texts as a two spirit mixed person and feel the immense connections that can be made between these theorizings on water and fluid M slash materiality that you're pointing to here. Oh, oh, that's a really good question. And let me read it over. How do you see it? 
can't I can can you see it I can uh, I can't yeah oh. no, I can't. <laughs> okay I, I'm gonna okay. copy and paste it to you right here okay so inform so this is a great question and my answer might not fulfill it to um, your complete liking, Lise. Um, again, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Is that transness and gender fluidity um, don't come up as much in my work for this chapter or for the dissertation. Like it's there, but it's not like the central task. Um, but I definitely think there's something to be said about like the shoal and the wake and ungendering and flows of ungendering being like these historical things that wash upon us, right? That um, that are in flux. Um, Tiffany Latavo King has this amazing idea of like black flux and what she thinks about as the fungibility of the black body like circulating like water and spilling over, right? Um, and I think that would be a dope place to start um, thinking about, um, you know, in the context of ungendering from like Spillers and also um, from C. Larry Riley Snorton's book, Black on Both Sides, thinking about the ways in which um, Black people's gender is, is fluid, but violently so. Like, what I'm trying to think through in all my work and in this in this chapter and in this whole dissertation is kind of like the both and, right? Like there's this terrible history of black people being treated like flesh and that's terrible and that's violent, and that's bullshit, right? But also somehow existing outside of the bounds of normative discourse and normative embodiment allows us to see things differently. And it's a both, it's a both and. So I think that's the best of what I can do in terms of my theorizing for transness. Um, if you get back to me in like August when the article comes out, I can see my article where I'm thinking about um, trans femininity and trans femmes as being the ones who embody this kind of original and anarchic like black, like fluid gender possibility and the dangers of that and the dangers of visibility for us. Like you can like, so please shoot me an email, but um, for this chapter specifically and the project specifically, like transness and gender fluidity come up, but it's not super central. So that's why this answer was kind of like hobbled together. But I think what you're thinking of is a very productive space to be thinking. And there's so much you could do with that conversation. I would love to see um, what work you make of that. It sounds like a really dope project and a really important topic. Great, great. Thank you for answering that. And Nathan, do you have, um capacity for about a couple more questions. I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I just want to be cognizant. I know you've been speaking for a long time. No, no, no. Sorry. <laughs> Eric Pritchard, I hope I'm Hey, sorry. fam. <laughs> <laughs> um, they said, truly terrific presentation, Nathan. Thank you so much. Really intrigued by the images used in your presentation and also the visuals that N.K. Jemison is crafting through her storytelling and visual representations of Black speculative fiction generally. Can you speak to slash elaborate on anything specific about the visuals you selected, reflect, reflect your arguments and your reading of the text or anything you find interesting about visual culture and Black speculative fiction? Does that figure into your larger project in any way? Yes, yes, yes. Um, first of all, thank you, Eric. Thank you, fam, for coming through. I love you. I appreciate you. I honor you. You the shit. I affirm you all the time. Um, so the images I picked was um, basically just for like visual interest for y'all um, because like I know what the world looks like because I've read these books like two times all the way through. Um, and I was just like, I know what this world looks like, but I want y'all to see, try to visualize what this world looks like because she renders it so beautifully. But even me as a creative writer, I can't like try to rent, I can't just like quote all of her stuff and like try to show it for y'all. So most of it, it was just for practicality. Um, but the point about visual culture is really important because um, this, this talk is of course, as I said, like an abbreviated portion of my dissertation chapter. And it's actually half it's a, an abbreviated portion of half of a dissertation chapter. So 
in this chapter, I'm thinking about the land and the Anthropocene through Jemison. And then there's an artist named uh, Fabrice Montero, who does these really beautiful, um, these really beautiful photo sets called The Prophecy, which thinks about um, climate disaster and spiritualism. And they're so to say is like visual culture is important to me because like every chapter of my work is usually like a literary text and like a visual text. So for this, it was like Jemison's novels and kind of like the stratification of that kind of storytelling with this very fluid imagery by Montero of like water and oil spills and blackness and the sea. So yeah, visual culture is really important to my project um, because as you know, I love comic books. Um, and the next chapter I'm writing on is about a graphic novel. So I am trying to kind of grapple with how um, across the diaspora and across genre, across medium, um, Black folk are really, you know, giving us alternative temporal imaginations and thinking about you know what the future can be like um what history does for us um all of that so yeah i'm definitely thinking about visual culture but that wasn't a part of this part of this talk proper but is a part of this larger chapter and i chose these pictures because y'all needed something more interesting to look at than uh, just my face basically great thank you for um yeah i can't wait to we be reading your articles, Nathan. Like, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let me see. Someone asked, let's see. Okay. Jeremy Glover asked, so firstly, thank you for this excellent talk. It was so incredibly thorough, and I appreciate your ability to weave together these three massive and challenging novels. My question is, how do you theorize Assun's and Nassun's relationship? I ask since the fact that Asun spends so much of the trilogy trying to reconnect with Nasun and ultimately, tragically, doesn't succeed seems intentional on the part of Jemison. Yeah, so I tried to touch on this in the talk, and I do it more, of course, in the chapter because it's longer. I theorize them, I theorize their relationship as a tension between kind of two forms of Black temporal imagination with a soon kind of imagining a future, however tangential, however fragile, however unstable, may be happening, right? May be possible with Nasum basically just being a nihilist and saying, fuck it all. The world needs to burn. I don't want nothing more out of it, right? And that's kind of what their relationship is. Because for the whole book, for the whole series, up until like the last book, they're literally on completely different sides of the continent. And for Asun, it's literally like under the earth in this underground uh, facility, right? Uh, or this underground community. So they literally don't have any relationship except for a kind of like philosophical one and a kind of intellectual tension between um, they're like between their past relationship of living together and then also being apart and growing and learning like Nasun starts off as this really beautiful like precocious like <laughs> like dope little girl and then sees how terrible the world is and says oh fuck that no 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 destroying it all and Nasun starts out as this woman with this incredible secret that she's hiding from her husband and her community and basically just trying to get through it and survive and it's actually like actually has like is actually a nihilist. So it in, it's interesting they actually like flip. Like Nasun starts the ser series with like a lot of hope and, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed and then just says, oh, fuck it. I'm not dealing with none of this. Everybody can die and that's cool. And then Asun basically starts off with having this long history of being trained by the fulcrum, being disrespected, being violated, having all her hopes and dreams smashed where she was just like, I'm going to stay right here and survive. I'm going to get what I can get. The rest of the world is terrible. And then becomes actually saying like, no, I've seen what people can do. I've seen this amazing community. I've seen, you know, the possibility of what a future, what a livable future could be like. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and make that happen. So their relationship really for me is kind of just this intellectual philosophical um, tension around like, how do we conceive of catastrophe? Is it just destruction? And do we just make peace with that? And do we say, fuck it all? Or do we say like, 
actually, we're going to respond to this in a way that's not just reactive, right, but also kind of proactive. What are we building? What are we shaping? So that's how I'm trying to think about their relationship. And it's not so much um, mother and daughter, because like they really, for the last two years or the whole, like, which is the whole scheme of the like story, are not together, are not really relating. So it's only really their actions and the, and the like driving forces behind those actions that I'm trying to theorize. So and also, I, I don't think that's like the one or only reading, like there could be so many other dope readings of that, but that's my, that's my take. Um, and I would love to see what um, other people are writing about um, this book or thinking about this series. Um, so yeah. Perfect. And so I, Nathan, if you would like to answer one more question. Um, yeah. yeah. And so I just want to say, like uh, share a comment really quickly. An anonymous attendee said, so when is Nathan hosting and sharing the book club? <laughs> Ooh. Oh man, yo, I I would love to do a, a, like a book club or just like a reading list. I'll just share a bunch of reading lists. Um, but yeah, that would be, that would be dope. That would be, that would be dope. But that would need to be a community effort, which means someone else would need to be my helpmate in that. Uh, someone else um, would need to help me coordinate. Um, but yeah, maybe. The answer is maybe, perhaps, in some future, in some future imagining. <laughs> yes, yes, um, definitely. And yes, um, Z Walbrook, there will be a reading list um, published shortly on blackmanradicals.com. And so hopefully a book club in the future. Um, Jordan Brown um, stated or asked, Joe here, I remember seeing a post once online that said for indigenous people, the apocalypse has already happened. How do you think that this apocalyptic experience has influenced the creativity and world building capabilities of indigenous people, especially in including black people and people of African descent? Yeah, so that that's a great point. And that's actually like the point I'm kind of working through. Like I actually am very displeased and disheartened and quite fucking annoyed with this idea that like disaster is new, right? Like it's actually new, new for whom, right? Um, because as people like Heather Davis and Zoe Todd will say, as people like Tiffany Latabo King will say, you know, like the relationship of disaster and these kind of racialized ecologies of harm are nothing new. I, you know, like <laughs> the world that, you know, Africans knew before enslavement ended as soon as they were put onto the boat and shuffled into the middle passage, right? The, the world that indigenous folk knew around the world was gone as soon as the white people showed up with gunpowder and saying that like Jesus needed them to live their lives differently, right? So for me, yeah, the whole point is that disaster has already happened <clears throat> and that in some ways, like we don't really need to fear that white people are now just catching up, right? Like in some ways we need to think about what are the ways we've always survived? You know, what are the ways we've always cared for each other? You know, as uh, Christina Sharp would say, in the wake, right? How have we always already been caring for each other? And if we take those points as like, I think the foundation for building new and better futures and more beautiful, pleasurable, um, thrivable lives, not just survivable, but thrivable, right? Um, that's kind of what I'm thinking about in my project. Like, how do we take those spaces, however tight and con conflicting and contextual they are, and think about that being the place um, in which um, we, we birth any imagining of the future of possibility, right? And I think that's like in tradition with a lot of Black feminist scholars and organizers and thinkers. So for me, yeah, it's definitely that. And I hope I hope I answered your question, um, Joe or Jordan, um, in which like, yeah, I definitely think the apocalypse already happened. It's just white people and privileged white people and privileged white people in the West are now like, oh shit, this might affect us, right? Like black people have always lived in exhausting, terrible things, right? There's a whole, there's whole scholarship that I wanna to touch on about environmental racism, right? In which black people have been living through disaster. Um, I know for me and like my growing up and coming to consciousness, it was Katrina, right? Like black people lived through this massive disaster, but weren't seen as disaster victims, weren't treated as disaster victims. You know, it's happened in Haiti with the earth, with with like multiple earthquakes and hurricanes, right? There are places, there are places literally on the planet, like 
presently and historically in which Black people have been living through disaster, but have not been seen as disaster victims because they themselves have been seen as like walking disasters, right? So I hope that answered your question and me just saying like, yeah, you're right, fam. Um, we've been living through disaster. It's just white people are now getting hip to it and now are being concerned about it. And that's what makes it new. Wow. Um, yeah, Jordan said, or Joe said, thank you so much, Nathan. Your talk was beautiful. And so, thank you. Nathan, I <laughs> appreciate you so much. I just appreciate you so much and want to thank you for such a brilliant teaching. It has definitely impacted, you know, so many people. I just want to read one comment and then I'll, we can dismiss, but um, Alice, Alice Kopp said, thank you so much for this teaching. I have learned a lot and I have a ton to think about, especially as a WGGS minor. Uh, much appreciated, um, Black more radicals than Nathan Alexander Moore. So, um, mm, I'm so touched, man. Thank you. Thank y'all. Thank y'all for showing up. I'm glad I wasn't just talking <laughs> to myself in the ether. <laughs> Thank y'all for showing up, man. Um, listening. Of course. And is there anything you would like to plug? Um, no, not, not, not really. Um, I am just um, literally <laughs> after this coming like end of this week into next week, I'm just like gearing up to start the start to work on the next chapter. So um, I don't got nothing to plug, but like pray for your girl. Um, she's just trying to trying to finish these, uh, finish these drafts, get these pages out into these streets to my committee. <laughs> um, I don't really have anything else, um, anything else on the horizon, but um, hopefully so many things will be um, coming. I have like creative things in the process that in the pro in the you know in the process that I hope will be able to be shared with the world soon. But nothing okay. tangible yet, but that don't mean it's not here. <laughs> it's not on its way. So true. That's <laughs> so so true. So Nathan, from the bottom of my heart, I just want to say you are amazing. Thank you for this brilliant conversation. Um everyone uh her teaching, Nathan's teaching, will be will live on Black More Radicals, and we'll be sharing the link and also the reading list. And just please support Nathan and all her amazing work. Um, and I just want to say thank you for saying yes. So much love to you and oh. see all these comments. And Girl. Just <laughs> Oh, is there a way you can like see them afterwards? I would love to just read through this. Yes, comments. you can. I definitely got you. So yeah. Ooh, it's just like gonna hype me up <laughs> for like <laughs> for when I'm just like, uh, what am I doing? I'm just like, okay, people see me. <laughs> this is what this is about because we definitely see you. And so yes, yeah, so thank you so much, everyone. Uh, and yes, thank you all so much for coming. Jamie, thank you again for like again like making this like this did not exist before and black women radicals is so necessary and proving it just every single day like i like i am so overjoyed that this was the platform and this was the organization that gave me the space to speak and i i i care about you girl i care for you, care you about my you. Heart. <laughs> i'm trying to get nk jemison over here oh surprise no would have died <laughs> <laughs> listen listen yes i'm so appreciative and of you and like hopefully you know see you again and so yeah maybe perhaps perhaps yes <laughs> yeah so thank you so much everyone please email nathan if you have any other questions and please. Yes. and be safe out there thank you so much thank you nathan thank you jamie thank you everyone for coming from the bottom of my heart so touched so touched love this bye everyone